Okay, so now we're going to talk about nutrient cycling or spiraling. If we're talking about a stream, and nutrients are taken up, then they are mineralized or remineralized, meaning that they are excreted. The cells die, eggs are laid, go through some microbial phases. Um, and so often students want to measure nutrients in streams. Well, knowing the instantaneous concentration of a nutrient at one point can be useful, but it's really not the whole picture. It just gives us a little bit of a snapshot. Um, it doesn't always tell us whether those nutrients are limiting. Um, and so here, here's an example of the nitrogen cycle. This is kind of a big comic. It's a messy cycle. There's so much going on. Nitrogen comes into systems through nitrogen fixing bacteria, through lightning. Um, when lightning strikes, it breaks apart the in, in triple bond and nitrogen gas, um, and through the Haber-Bosch process, which is basically the fossil fuel drive um, development of fertilization. And then, then we can have um, all of these, you know, once the plants take, take it up or the bacteria uh, fix the nitrogen and then put it into plant biomass, that plant biomass then can break down and those nutrients can be mobilized and available to other organisms. And there's this whole process of aminization, ammonification, nitrification, and those are creating things like ammonia, ammonium, nitrite, nitrate, um, and then denitrification is the conversion of that nitrate back into nitrogen gas. So anyway, this is a lot more complicated. We would need a few weeks to really get into the full nitrogen cycle, um, but there are some really important issues with nitrogen. So both nitrate and nitrate um, contamination is a real problem. And so your drinking water standards tell you that 10 milligrams per liter is the maximum. If you have more than that, it can lead to methoglobinemia, <laughs> sorry, methemoglobinemia, which is also called blue baby syndrome. It's where nitrate binds to hemoglobin and it actually has a higher affinity um, for hemoglobin than oxygen does. And so if you make baby formula with high nitrate drinking water, it can cause serious problems. And this is a really common um, problem in agricultural areas. So you can measure things like um, the, the spiraling length, how long it takes for, um, so say we follow um, a nitrogen molecule, um, we can measure its spiraling length. And so, the, spir the total spiraling length is the distance that, it's travel that it travels in its dissolved form, plus the distance it travels as a particulate. And so um, you, would, you could measure this in a lot of different ways. This is just a model showing that if the, the system, the ecosystem is processing nitrogen um, quickly and it goes from one state to another fast, then its spiral length is short. Um, versus a system that's slower about taking it up and transforming it into a different form would have a longer um, uptake and turnover and be more inefficient. So the spiraling nutrient spiraling concept tells us that spiraling length will be greater when discharge is greater, when velocity is greater, and when there's more disturbance in the benthic zone. So um, basically, you know, these, these distances can all be um, affected by the environment. And um, spiraling length will also be greater when insect drift is more common. So when there's more, more disturbance in the benthic zone, insects will drift more. And so you'll probably end up with a longer spiraling length. So how do we measure this? You can choose five sampling locations, say at equal distances downstream from a location where you're gonna add um, some nutrients. You would want to measure the background concentrations of those nutrients and the conductivity of the water prior to adding. Then you would drip in your nutrient. You would also at the same time drip in a conservative tracer, something that isn't taken up by the biota, but that could maybe influence conductivity. So you might add um, some chloride or bromide um, ions because that will tell you how much of the, the stuff that you're adding has made it downstream. And then um, you probably want to only increase the nutrients just slightly. Um, you don't want to end up, you know, causing damage to the system. But stable isotope nutrient additions can be really helpful in this case because then you can follow the isotopic concentrations through. 
Um, you don't want to saturate the biota. And then what you do is you measure the downstream transport and decline in both the nutrient and the conservative tracer. And so the conservative tracer is telling you how much the nutrient would travel without being taken up by the biota at all. And then measuring, measuring the nutrient would tell you how much is being taken up by the biota. So we tend to use a Marriott bottle or some fancy electronic pump. And then this shows you kind of those transects moving downstream as you're dripping things. And then um, once you kind of see the conductivity is at a plateau, then you would take all water samples at all five transects again and measure conductivity at each. And that would give you a sense of overall nutrient um, mineralization rates. And this will help you calculate uptake length. So, um, okay, so to calculate the uptake length, the uptake length equals the inverse of the absolute value of the slope of the line. So we can measure the, the natural log of the tracer divided by the tracer of the, the um, chloride, for instance. So in this case, we'll look at the ratio of the ammonium to the tracer of chloride. And we will look at the, the, the distance downstream from the injection site. And then we would calculate the slope of this line. Okay, so in this case, the slope would be negative 0 0.0029 um, based on the equation of the line here. And if SW is the uptake length, is the inverse of the absolute value of the slope, what would the SW be? So I'll let you do that calculation. You can pause the video, try to calculate it, and then I'll give you the answer. Okay, so the answer should be 344 meters. So um, that would be the uptake length for this particular um, ammonium molecule, basically. So here's a scientist filtering water samples for isotope analysis during a tracer test in Sugar Creek, Indiana, and this allows for direct observations of denitrification within the creek. So in this case, they're measuring denitrification. So just real fast, um, we mainly talked about stream ecosystems, but we could make some comparisons between things like wetlands, large lakes, um, and streams. And so if we look at seasonal variation being low versus high, we would have low variation across the seasons for groundwater, um, and then much higher variation across the seasons for wetlands, lakes, and streams. Um, looking at spatial variability of benthic substrates, um, we'd have very low spatial variability in large lakes and aquifers, um, kind of middle variation in wetlands and really high variation in streams. Looking at spatial linkages, you have low linkage for groundwater and large lakes, high linkage for wetlands and streams. Um, allochthonous carbon inputs, low um, allochthonous carbon for groundwater and large lakes, medium for wetlands and small lakes, and high for streams. Nutrient input, um, again, low for groundwater, medium for lakes, wetlands, and streams, um, especially oligotrophic systems, and then high for eutrophic lakes, wetlands, and streams. And then the terrestrial influence, again, low for groundwater, high for streams. And hydro hydrological variance, um, again, low for groundwater, middle for lakes, and high for streams. So we see these kind of patterns over and over again in terms of um, comparing different types of ecosystems. And then if we're interested in um, their food webs, here you can see the food webs of a groundwater system, mainly DOC and FPOM microbes and a few tiny little guys, little collectors and some flatworm predators versus wetlands. You have you know, some, some stuff coming in from dissolved organic and fine particulate, coarse particulate organic matter, a lot of macrophytes and paraphyton leading to a pretty complicated wetland system. Um, lakes, more reliance on different sources of algae. So like phytoplankton and paraphyton and macrophytes and a lot less reliance on allochthonous carbon inputs, although there, there is some in lakes. Um, they just have a low, kind of a low lacustrine area to surface area ratio. And then streams, because of course they're running through these terrestrial landscapes, have a lot higher reliance on dissolved, fine, and coarse particulate organic matter, and then some macrophytes and some paraphyton, but you don't see the same 
kind of phytoplankton communities um, and their reliance in streams. All right, and there's some freshwater ecosystems for you.